Revelation, not shuns, Revelation chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 8 through 14. I think we can get through it all tonight. If uh, we miss something, Pastor Cliff can fix it next week. But let's, let's recap here from verses 1 through 7, and then we'll get right into 8. Okay, so let's read 1 through 7 and recapitulate here, and then we'll go on. So the Bible says, Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with the writing on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look in it. And I cried and I cried because no one was found worthy to open the scroll of even to look in it. The one of the, then one of the elders said to me, Stop crying. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has been victorious so that he may open the scroll and his seven seals. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing before the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He came and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. So just again, let's just cap, uh, recover these seven verses here. We talked about the scroll. And the, and the scroll, as we mentioned, we know about the seven seals. What else do we know about this scroll that we've learned in the past? Writings on all sides, right? All right. And what else? Open side to side right, right, rather than uh, up and down, which would be horizontal, right? So, right? Horizontal is up and down and vertical. Yeah, horizontal side to side, vertical is up and down. So it opens horizontally side to side. All right. Anything else? That's right. Right. And in order to open those seals, they were just one seal after another, right? And what are those seals? How did they seal in the uh, ancient times? Yeah, usually king's ring with uh, wax from the candle, right? So therefore you could tell if it had been tempered with or not. Uh, anything else we want to add there to the uh, scroll, Pastor Cliff? Um, I think that's everything. All right. All right, so we got the scroll, and then we went into this loud proclaiming voice angel. And he issued a challenge. Remember, that's what we looked at a little bit here. What was his challenge? Who is worthy to open the scroll? Not who is willing, but who is worthy, right? Who is ultimately has the authority to open the scroll? And then he goes on to say, we know that no one on heaven, no one on earth or under the earth is able to open the scroll or even to look at it. There's only one that we're going to see. Now, one thing I didn't mention last week, I think it's worth mentioning, look at verse 4. And John, I cried and cried because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look in it. Why did John cry? You know why John cried? Because here. Uh, the judgment that's on the earth right now, it's over it, and it's still in effect. That's correct. That the righteous king that has come to abolish the power of sin over humanity is not only coming, but it's still going to be in that body. That's right. That was one thing. And then think about the other thing. Where was John at when he wrote this letter? On the Isle of Patmos. Right? And he was there only because he was standing on the Word of God. He was believing in Jesus the Messiah. And so therefore he was exiled. So after being there and all that pressure and all that persecution to be taken up to heaven and be there. And remember in John where it talks about uh, Christ said, I'm going to leave and I'm going to prepare a house for you. Right? And there where I am you will be there also. So that when he gets to heaven... And God's supposed to make all this happen. There's no one worthy to open the scroll. So wouldn't you cry too? Like, I thought this was the completion here. And so therefore he had to go through these things. And that's one of the elders, verse 5, says stop crying. He comes and comforts him. And then we looked at last week the, the lion from the tribe of Judah and the root of David. And we saw that reference to uh, the, lion, the tribe of Judah in Genesis and the root of David talking about the lineage of David, right? And then uh, who was David's father? Jesse. And we, we looked at that, right? And the Old Testament, how humility. And then we went on to read here. Let's read it. All right. So the lion tribe of Judah and the root of David has been victorious, so he may open the scroll and its seven seals. And then verse 6. New thing we saw last week. Then I saw one like a slaughtered 
lamb standing. How do you have a lamb standing and yet it looks like it's been slaughtered? Well, that's the picture we have here. And also I told you that this slaughtered lamb was not just any lamb, but it was a little lamb. You can't have a greater contrast in the animal kingdom than a lion and a lamb. And not just a lamb, but a little lamb. Right? And so this is the contrast that we have that from now on in chapter 6 all the way to chapter 19, this little lamb is the one that's going to bring judgment on a rebellious earth. Okay? And then so we see this lamb, the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. We, we don't need to go over that again. But then we also saw the seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. All right, so let's talk about these horns again. What do we learn about the horns? We know in the regular earth, with all the animals, what horns signify. In the, in the Old Testament, it's the same thing. What do horns signify? Weapon. That's right, weapon, right? It's the strength, it's the power. The ram, the bull, that's what it signifies here. So even though we have this little lamb that appears like a slaughter lamb, it still has the strength, right? And so we want to make uh, no misconception about this, that this is not a helpless little lamb. He has all the strength. Right? And he has seven eyes and the seven spirits of God. And we talked about this a little bit, but let me reemphasize. There's only three persons of the Godhead. You don't have seven plus two, right? And so the eyes are all seeing of the earth, right? All knowing, all seeing. And seven is perfection. So seven of the perfect of the Lamb. And then verse seven, we ended last week. He came and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. Now let's look at verses 8 through 14. All right. So let's read 8 through 10, and then we'll read 11 through 14 in just a moment. So verse 8. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and a gold, gold bowls filled with incense, which are prayers of the saints. Verse 9. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered. You redeemed people for God by your blood from every tribe, every language, and people and nation. And you made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. Alright? Now, how many of you have seen the pictures where it shows saints that are sitting in heaven playing their harps? This is where it's coming from, right? Turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 25 and let's look at this together. To this, to us, this seems very strange, but not to the Old Testament saints and not to the book of Psalms. This is also known as the Psaltery. There was, songs were played in the book of Psalms and prayers. Say again. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 25. All right, we're going to look at two verses here. Look at verse, verses 6 and 7. The Bible says, And all these men were under their own father's authority for the mu music in the Lord's temple with cymbals and harps and lyres for the service of God's temple. All right, and, and then it goes on to name the other ones for the king's authority. They numbered 288 together with their relatives who were all trained and skillful in music for the Lord. We have the piano. We have other instruments. But in the Old Testament, and specifically in the book of Psalms, they used the harp, the psaltery. So this is where we have this. So going back to Revelation, we see here that each one had a harp and a gold bowl filled with incense. Now the earlier generations might have been confused with this. But for us with all of the modern technology, it's not hard for us to understand. These are, as it says here, look what it says. A golden bowl is filled with incense, which are prayers of the saints. If God can create the universe, how hard would it be for him to put on paper or some other written form or whatever form he desires to put inside these bowls all the prayers of the saints? We, we see in our generation how much technology has been used and how you can gather all the data and information. So here it is. That is, it is what it says it is. That's what they are. Gold bowls filled with incense and the prayers of all these saints. And with that, we move into verse 9. They sang a new song. 
Now this reference is used six or seven times throughout the Bible. We're going to look at uh, two of them. And let me give you two to look at at another time. So if you want to write these down, we're going to look at Psalms 96 and Psalms 98. What I want you to look at is Isaiah 42 and Psalms 149 uh, this week. Isaiah 42 and Psalms 149. You look at those and compare those four together. And these are four of the seven that deal with the new song. But let's us look at Psalms 96. And let's see what these say. Psalms 96. And then we'll look at Psalms 98. Psalms 96. Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to Yahweh, praise His name. Proclaim His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations. His wonderful works among all the peoples. For the Lord is great and highly praised. He is feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. As we listen to some of these words, see if they don't reappear here in Revelation 5 for us. Ascribe to the Lord your families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord's glory and strength. Ascribe to Yahweh the glory of His name. Bring an offering and enter His courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. Say among the nations... The Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be shaken. He judges the people fairly. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea and all that fills it resound. Let the fields and everything in them exult. Then all the trees of the forest will shout for joy before the Lord. For He is coming. For He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with His faithfulness. Let's look at Psalms 98 and see how much of this is repeated there. These four and three others compile this new song that's talked about here in Revelation. They overlap each other. Look at 98, 1 through 9. Sing a new song to the Lord, for He has performed wonders. His right hand and only arm have won Him victory. The Lord has made victory known. He has revealed His righteousness in the sight of all the nations. He, he has remembered His love and faithfulness to the house of Israel and the ends of the earth. I have seen our God's victory. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Be jubilant. Shout for joy and sing. Sing to the Lord with a lyre or harp, with a lyre and the melodious song, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Sound triumphantly in the presence of the Lord our King. Let the sea... And all that fills it, the world and those who live in it, resound. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains shout together for joy before the Lord. For He is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world righteously and the peoples fairly. Now turn back to Revelation 5. We see that chapters 4 and 5 are the two chapters that are pre-tribulation so they're setting up the scene and we and we saw last week that in chapter 5 John saw five things remember that remember verse 1 then I saw the scroll and then what in verse 2 I saw a mighty angel right and then verse 6 what did he see the lamb and then what was the last fourth thing that he saw verse 11 then I looked I saw and heard the voice of many angels and we'll look at that here in just a moment but we see these four presidings to the tribulation. So the new song here in verse 9. Look what Revelation records. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slaughtered and you redeemed people for God by your blood and from every tribe and language and people and nation. Let's, let's look at that. By what means did God redeem His people? So the sacrifice, and what does it say right there in, in, in the scripture, right there in verse 9? It's right there, right for us. The blood, right? The blood. The sacrifice is right, but it's right there for us. The blood. That was the means that he redeemed the people by his blood. Right? And what peoples are we talking about? Are we just talking about Abraham and his descendants? All peoples. Look, he makes it very clear to us. From every tribe. 
Are you from a certain tribe? Do you have people that belong to your tribe? What about your language? Every tribe, every language, and every people, and every nation. Universality, the whole globe. Jesus is worthy, the Lamb is worthy because He was slaughtered, His blood paid for all peoples. And if He shed His blood for all peoples, then why wouldn't He not have the right to judge all peoples? It's not like He said, I came to die for Abraham, so the rest of you Gentiles, you're out of luck, so I'm just going to judge you because you're bad. No, He died for the Gentiles, us. And so therefore, He is the righteous person to judge all peoples because he died for every person on this earth. And as a result, look at verse 10. You made them a kingdom and a priest to our God and they will reign on the earth. Now, do we all in this room believe tonight we will one day reign on this earth? I hope so, because the Bible says it here, right? You read it literally, that's what it says. But unfortunately, we have many churches around the world and even here in our own town that say, no, we're not going to have a literal rain. If the Bible says it, then how can you not believe it? It goes back to what we saw this morning, is when you start picking and choosing, you place yourself in a very peculiar place with the Lord, trying to reinterpret the, the Bible to fit our own agenda, rather than saying, Lord, you've said it, I believe it, now help me understand and give me insight. Right? We will all reign. So let's look at two places that talk about that. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19. And after we look at Matthew 19, we'll go to 1 Corinthians. Matthew 19, verse 28. Jesus said to them, I assure you, in the messianic age, when the Son of Man sits on His glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on your twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone who has left houses and brothers and sisters, fathers or mothers, children or fields, because of my name, will receive a hundred times more, and will inherit eternal life. He was talking to the apostles and to the Jewish people, right? All right, so if we just say, well, is it just about the Jewish people reigning? Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and see what that says. So we have this group of people. Let's see if the groups of people don't expand. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse 2. Don't you know that the saints will judge the world? I did just say the Jewish people, but he says all saints. And if the world is to be judged by you, you're unworthy to be judged by the smaller cases. Now look what it goes on to verse 3. Not only do we have the Jewish people ruling and now all the saints, look what verse 3 says. Don't you know that we will judge angels? So all the saints are encompassed and all the angels now encompassed. So we all will have a future reign. He makes it very clear here. So go back to Revelation 5. So we see this. That he is worthy. Because he's redeemed with his blood. All these peoples from all these nations. And he's given them a kingdom. And one day we will all reign. And then look what verse 11 goes on to say. Then I look, or I saw, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. How many angels? Many, we don't know. Around the throne. Also the living creatures, the four living creatures, and the elders. We've talked about them before. So you have these three groups, and then watch this next group. Their number was countless thousands. Other translation says this. 10,000 times thousands. So a better word would be countless. That's why we have it here for us. The number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. Can you make it any more explicit? That the number is too vast to explain and we have no idea what the number would be. Right? Just like when he promised 
Abraham children as many as what? The stars and, and the sand of the seashores. You, you can't count individual grains of sand no matter how hard you try. That's a good exercise to take our children, right, on an afternoon. Say, you know what, I'm going to give you $25 if you can tell me how much sand is on this beach here in Myrtle Beach. I'm going to go over here and take a little nap, and you wake me up in about three hours, okay, and tell me how much you've counted. That would be a nice little exercise and probably a relaxing afternoon, right? Countless angels. And then look what they said in verse 12. Then they said with a loud voice, the lamb who was slaughtered is worthy. Were they to do what? To receive all power and riches and wisdom and strength. There are seven things mentioned here. And I just read the first four. Power, which is dunamis. The ability, the might to do all these things. He's worthy of all that. What about the riches? Everything that the world has. All the minerals and the jewels. How about this? The monies in our pockets. Everything, all the riches belong to him. So how do we feel about that, about our own riches in our pockets, that it belongs to Him? Right? All of this is to reveal to our hearts of, do we shout with the exaltation because we are His children, or do we resist? And that's what the world has been doing up to this point, rebelling and resisting. And when Christians have a hard time with this, what do you mean God has all the power and all the riches and all the wisdom and all the strength? If there's anything that recalls with that, it reveals the heart that they're not truly surrendered to the king of kings. And their salvation should be questioned. So he has these four things. And as a result of having these four things, this is what we are to bestow upon him. Honor, glory, and blessing. What does it talk about in the Old Testament about when a gray-headed person walks into the room? What are the younger people supposed to do? Well, listen is one. But they're to stand up. Honor them. Stand up. Notice it doesn't say bow to them. Because we bow down to no man or no angel, right? But they stand and show respect and honor. But to the Lamb, we're going to prostrate ourselves downwardly. And we're going to bow because He's the only one worthy for that kind of honor and glory and blessing. And then verse 13 is an interesting verse. You tell me if this is going to happen at this moment. I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, in the sea, everything in them say, blessing and honor, glory and dominion, or all power, to the one seated on the throne, to the Lamb forever and ever. This is before the tribulation. We've already looked ahead of time, and we, we talked about tribulation a little bit, when the people are going to shake their fists, and they're going to be angry with God. So this verse is saying that all peoples, heaven, earth, under the sea, everyone's going to just praise Him. Will that happen at, before chapter 6 or at 6? No, this is a future prediction of what's going to happen. Look at Philippians chapter 2. And I'll show you how that's possible in a second. We, we, we've seen it before, and so it shouldn't. Any serious Bible student would not be confused about that. But let me show you what it talks about in Philippians chapter 2, about every knee bowing. And then we'll look at an Old Testament scripture that we see that happening before where something was prophesied in, in uh, Isaiah and it didn't have its full completement in the New Testament but it only had partial fulfillment and then a future fulfillment was waiting. Look at Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11. 5 through 11. Here's what it says. Make your own attitude that of Jesus Christ, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as someone or something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave. That's not the first time we've seen that word slave here lately, has it? Mother Mary, the bond slave. The Apostle Paul, a slave. Us are what? Slaves. Slaves. If we want to be rightly aligned with the king, we should see ourselves properly as slaves. Right? Assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men, and when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even to the death on the cross. And here it is. For this reason, God 
highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth that day is in the future that's after Revelation 6 19 and we don't even see it complete until Revelation 20 when, when Christ is through fighting against Satan and his dominions so all of Revelation 6 all the way to 20 we have to work through that before every knee will bow so when it said there back at Revelation chapter 5 verse 13 let's look at that again that every creature in heaven on the earth and the sea and everything in them will say blessing and honor this is a future prediction of once all the enemies have been put under Christ have been made the footstool for Christ now let me show you the Old Testament passage I was talking about go to Isaiah 61 Isaiah 61 And you've, you've heard this passage before, but we want to use it as a reminder that several times throughout Scripture, God gives us in a certain passage within two or three verses things which are and things which are to come, and maybe all in one verse, just a few words separating. But look at Isaiah chapter 61, two verses, one and two. Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2 the Bible says in the Spirit of the Lord God is on me this is Christ because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor so look at verse 2 three things proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of God's vengeance and to comfort all that mourn. Remember those three things. I got it written down here. The first one is what? To proclaim what? The year of the Lord's favor. The second thing is to do what? Day of God's vengeance. And the third one is to comfort all those who mourn. Now this language sounds familiar, doesn't it, to us? Because we've seen it before in the New Testament. Look over at Luke chapter 4. Look at Luke and we'll see how this is partially fulfilled. And what Christ says, He says it out of His mouth that today this is fulfilled and yet we're going to see that there's parts of it missing that we saw there in Isaiah because there's future fulfillment waiting to happen. Luke chapter 4 verses 16 through 19 verse 16 it talks about when Jesus came to Nazareth and he was rejected. Here it says, He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogues on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. What, what does he mean he found the place? Well, he don't have the Bible like we have today in chapters and in verses. It was a scroll, remember? So he had to open the whole scroll of Isaiah and find out where that place was what was happening that very day and what happened that very day when he wrote, read the scroll here's what it says look at verse 18 the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recover the sight to the blind to free the oppressed doesn't that sound like Isaiah 61 1 now what about verse 2 look at 19 to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor Okay, well that's one of the three. Let's read on. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. It would be kind of like me reading parts of John 3.16. For God so loved the world, closed the book and sat down. Right? I mean, you're like, hey, what's going on here? There's more to the verse here. We, something's missing. Right, so what does he say? Look what he says. So the eyes were on him, right? They were fixed on him. He began saying to them, today as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. Because verse 17 in John 3, 16, verse 17 says, He didn't come to the world to condemn the world, but the world through Him might be saved. So He didn't come to bring the vengeance of the day of the Lord. He didn't come to comfort all who mourn. That was future prophecy at His next coming, not His first coming. 
right? So it's not unusual to us when we look at the scriptures. That's why it's important to look at context, cross-references, and understand that God sometimes has given us everything right here, but with future fulfillment. He's trying to show us. He wants us to be good students and to dig for the nuggets and to mine and to realize just because it's right here doesn't mean it's always all fulfilled. You right now, there is a huge movement to say that Revelation was written. Watch this, Pastor Cliff. Revelation was written in uh, when? What what do we guess it is? Right, so closer probably to 94 AD. They want to say it's more like 60-something. And here's the reason. Because in AD 70, Jerusalem was taken by the general Titus. And then now Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 is fulfilled in AD 70. But that's not the case. And even if that's the case, we saw in Daniel 9, 25, that the seven years was still in the future after the Messiah was cut off, which was in the New Testament, which was after AD 70. See, so they're, they're, they're uh, missing the whole point and trying to compile it all down to one to make it fit their terminology. Because God's done with Israel. They rejected God. So why would God still love Israel? Why would He? Because He said, His covenant. He said, He's faithful. He's not like man. Right? And that's the problem, problem with people when they try to reinterpret Scripture or ignore Scripture rather than taking it at face value and saying, I may not understand it, but if God said it, I better accept it and keep digging and keep mining rather than trying to rewrite this reform theology and rewriting and stuff. These men that think they're so much smarter than the early church fathers. That's vanity. We need to go back and we need to study and say, what does the scripture say? Take time. right? It's, it's not a casual gleaning, but it's a digging deeper and adding every year as we add to these stories, more and more light becomes apparent to us. Just like this morning when we looked at Luke. Wasn't that a whole new picture of Elizabeth and John the Baptist? And every year is at Christmas time, there's more and more. And that's what we need to ask God. Refresh. Make it anew to us. What is the Christmas story? 2,000 years later, we still want to be in awe about the Savior's birth and why we come to this year. And we want to have that joy of fresh and new like when we first got saved, right? And that's the whole point. If we have that kind of spirit, God will reveal it to us. So let's go back here to Revelation 5. Let me finish out. Revelation 5. So we looked at verse 13. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth on the sea. So if we're not convinced that it's everything, he says in the sea. Heaven, earth, under the earth, sea. Where else can they be? Right? He's trying to say everything. Now one thing that's not excluded from this passage and that's a possibility and some commentators say different things. But think about this. And we have precedence for this. What about the animals? Could you imagine the animals speaking and hollering out too? That's what my point is. Blessing and honor, even the animals. Well, that's, that's kind of weird, is it? How about a donkey that spoke to a wicked prophet that would not obey? If God made it happen then, could he not make it happen again? I'm not saying we have it 100% here in Scripture. But it's a very big possibility, right? Because who would have thought that the lion and the lamb will lay down again and that a kid can put his hand in the snake's hole? We saw that last week when we talked about the root of, of David and the root of Jesse. That all of this is going to go back to the Garden of Eden. He's setting the, stone, the, the stage for us that he's fixing to unleash all of his judgments, chapter 6 through 19, and then the final destruction of Satan and all of his dominions and foes in chapter 20. But before he does that, he's trying to say he is the one who shed his blood so that we would receive the pardon rather than his judgment or those that would hear this. And as a result, look at verse 14 and we close. The four living creatures said, what else can they say but amen? Hallelujah, exciting. And the elders fell down in worship. And, and what about us? What should we want to do? Amen. Lord, come. Even now, come. We're excited. We can't wait. We, we want to have our new home. We, we want to be able to fall down before you because you are all worthy of all of our honor, glory, and blessing. Nothing in us should recoil from saying, why should God judge the world? 
No, he should, because how long will he put up with the stubborn, rebellious, stiff-necked people that will continually to kill the innocent lives of babies, that will make a mockery of the home that he's created, man and woman? How long will he bear with that, right? And so everything in us ought to say, yes, Lord, you are the worthy, righteous judge. Even so, come and make it right so that we're free from all the effects of sin and the curse of sin. Amen.